out to Jess. Welcome back to Roots and Refuge Farm. Today, we are talking about a subject that so many of you have been asking for a video about, and it is one of my favorite subjects to talk about this time of year, and that is seed starting. Um, I'm standing in my garden right now, and truth be told, there's not just a whole lot to look at because it's the end of January here in Zone 7B. But I've been coming down here every day and just walking up and down the rows here, checking out my raised beds, and making a plan of what I'm going to plant. So today I want to talk to you about the ins and outs of seed starting. Let's head up to the greenhouse and let's talk about how to start seeds. The garden is my favorite place to be in the growing season, but the greenhouse is my favorite place to be in the winter. It's just so warm out here, so completely full of life. I love the greenhouse. Let's address why it would be beneficial to start from seed. And the most obvious reason is just that it expands your growing season. Now, when it comes time to plant your garden, after the risk of frost has passed, you have a few options. You can direct sow, which means you take uh, seeds and you plant them directly in your garden, wherever they're gonna grow, be it raised beds or in the ground. Um, or you can go to the store you can buy plant starts that are already started or you know attend a plant sale just whatever buy plants that someone else started from seed or you can start from seed yourself whenever you direct so um, that plants life is starting as you're putting the seed in the ground and so for instance if it's like a squash which might be like a 50 day variety you put the seed in the ground and 50 days later you're picking edible fruit off your plant and that's a short season that's an early thing now the problem comes up for someone who lives like in a no more northern climate your growing season isn't as long as mine and so if you're not clear from frost until june even those 50 day varieties they're not going to be coming into fruition until pretty late in the growing season so by by starting your seeds when it's still cold outside you're just getting a jump start on your growing season. And this is really important with things like tomatoes and peppers, which can be 80 or 90 day varieties. These take much longer to come to fruition. So by starting them six to eight weeks before your frost is passed, that's six to eight weeks sooner in the summer that you're going to be getting fruit off those plants. And in the case of something like an indeterminate tomato plant, they begin bearing fruit and they continue to bear fruit. So if you start them earlier, not only are you going to get your fruit earlier, you're going to keep your fruit longer. They're going to continue bearing as the summer carries on and as the season carries on. And so you get a whole extra six to eight weeks of harvest altogether. That can make a pretty big difference and that can amount to a lot of food. Now here in the South where I do have a long growing season, I actually have the option of direct sowing things like tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. You can do that here, um, but you're really cutting the window of harvest much shorter but for someone who lives up in the north uh, you probably would not be able to grow those things at all if you were not starting those because you simply wouldn't have enough time for them to ripen fruit before the frost came back in the fall and and killed them on top of there being an issue of having shorter seasons and wanting to grow longer uh, season varieties that need more warm days there's also kind of the opposite issue which I deal with here in Arkansas um, I don't have have long springs uh, we have pretty mild winters but they are cold enough that you can't always grow things directly through them however there are a lot of cooler crops brassica specifically like cabbages cauliflower broccoli um, that I have a hard time growing without starting the seeds inside first like I have just started my brassicas back here and, and I will be moving those out in February after they're well established. Otherwise, if I planted them directly from seed in my garden, once it was warm enough to plant them, by the time they got to the point of being harvestable, it would be too warm for them. They would be sprouting, they would be bolting, the carrots would be no good. So I really I depend on starting seeds inside in a controlled environment in order to be able to kind of extend my season with cooler crops. So it depends on where you are, but no matter where you are, starting seeds inside can really give you more control over the season that you're growing. Another benefit of seed starting is the options that it opens up. 
if you go in the spring to your local farmers co-op, um, big box store, hardware store, gardening center, there are going to be plant starts. Um, a lot of times, uh, all of these places will have sourced from the same uh, nationwide company. And that means that you're going to go and you're going to see a lot of the same varieties. Now, if you go to a plant sale or a locally owned store that, that sources from a locally owned nursery, sometimes you'll be able to get more varieties and they'll be more interesting. But still, you're really limited on varieties. You know, you're usually going to have uh, several hybrids, uh, a lot of times F1 hybrids to choose from, um, and then a handful of popular heirlooms, things like uh, Cherokee Purple or ones that are a little more known. And then, like I said, at those plant sales, you might be able to get your hands on some more uh, interesting or rare plants. But for the most part, you just don't have a massive selection. Now, if you check with an heirloom seed company, I'm going to use Baker Creek as an example but there are so many of them. You can go now in the winter whenever you're itching for gardening and, and order their seed catalogs. And in them, you can see that your choices are just massively different. I'm going to use tomatoes as an example because this is my absolute favorite thing to grow. And as you can see here in Baker Creek Seed Catalog, that there are just pages and pages and pages of tomatoes. So, hundreds of options, different colors, different sizes. So many of them have stories and that is incredible. My favorite thing about starting from seed is it opens up the world of heirlooms and rare seeds and and you get to try things that you might not ever otherwise see or hear of or get to taste. There are options in this catalog. There are things that I've grown in my garden that I've never seen for sale at a grocery store, that I have never seen on a menu of a restaurant. And I've gotten to eat those foods at this point and grow them and experience them. And that to me is worth any extra work that might um, come up from starting seeds. And for me personally, gardening is hard sometimes. Sometimes it really is. And there comes a point in gardening, especially when it's really hot or you face discouragements or you face failures, there will come a moment in your gardening journey or multiple moments if you're anything like me that you want to give up. That you're like, man, forget this. I can go buy food at the grocery store for a heck of a lot cheaper and easier than what this is costing me. But when you've invested some interest in varieties that you're eager to try, um, that you're wanting to experience things you might not otherwise ever get to experience, it really is an extra push during those hard times to say, no, I'm going to keep going because this is worth it. This is different than anything I can get at the store. And I would really be giving something up if I quit this. Now, the next pro to starting seeds, it's a, it's a little bit, <laughs> it, it, this might not actually hold true in all situations. Now, seed starting can be significantly cheaper. Can be. Um, if you can resist the urge to buy every single uh, variety of, of plant, which some people, I won't name any names, don't always resist that urge and end up with massive seed collections that cost way more than just going and buying started plants. But seriously, if you are trying to be cost conscious in starting your garden, starting from seeds really can be a cheaper option. You can uh, check into seed banks. I know there's one local to me here. I live uh, in central Arkansas and there's one at the Conway Library. Um, they're having a seed swap. There is a seed bank. Um, there are places that are swaps online there are ways that you can go about getting multiple varieties of seeds for cheaper there are also uh, cheap seed options now if you shop somewhere like Baker Creek whenever you get a package of seeds you are getting you know a hundred seeds in a package for three dollars and fifty cents and so if you wanted to grow one type of tomato you could grow as many as you could possibly need out of that one package of seeds you can start a lot of plants for significantly less than it would cost you to go buy started plants at the store I think started plants run somewhere in the like three 
3 to 350 range, more if you're buying organic and more if you're buying unusual varieties from a plant sale. And if you're growing very much at all, that can really add up. So if you're looking to garden frugally, starting seeds really is the way to go. Now let's talk about the options in purchasing seeds. Um, I have a video which I will link below talking about some of my favorite seed companies if that's a resource that you want. I love supporting companies that are doing what they can to further the heirloom movement and the real food movement and just the uh, education about gardening. However, there are other options. I mean, you could just go into your local box star, buy some seeds, um, dollar stores, dollar trees, and dollar generals often get a limited amount of seeds in that run like 20 cents a pack or something like that and a lot of people will tell you that those are terrible quality and terrible germination rates they might not be as high quality as some of the places that you're going to see online but if it's your only option to garden try them let's talk about materials in order to start seeds you're going to need some sort of container to put them in and some sort of medium to grow them in now there are a lot of places that will tell you different things there are soil based mediums there are soilless mediums i can only really tell you what works for me my choices and how i do things here on my farm and in my greenhouse is based on my own needs i start a lot of plants not only do i have a very large garden but i sell plant start so i always start extra um truth be told i get carried away in buying seeds i like starting extra it gives me something to do, I really enjoy it, um, and I'm able to recoup a little bit of money from it. Because of that, when I'm starting a thousand plants, the little bags of seed starting medium that cost $5 for a small bag, those have never been feasible for me. And so what I have done for the last three years that has worked is I just start with a good potting mix. Here's a look at what I use. Um, what I usually do, get the big chunks out. Sometimes there will be little twigs or pieces of bark. But I like to use organic soil and this is just a soil that I like. That particular bag is called Bacto. I have no affiliation with that company. I have not done extensive testing on it. I've just used it for a few years and I like it. The main thing I can tell you is what you want. You want something that's loose. Um, this already has uh, cocoa core and perlite in it. Therefore, it helps hold moisture. The main thing that you don't want is really dense um, soil. So do not buy bagged garden soil. When I first got started, the very first time I started seeds, I made that mistake and I bought garden soil. I didn't know any better. And uh, my seeds actually all sprouted and then they stayed exactly the same. They couldn't grow. Um, it was too, it was too dense. I ended up repotting all of them into potting soil and then they took off and grew just fine. From then on, I always bought potting soil and that is what I start seeds in. So this year in my greenhouse, you're going to see me using these little two and a half inch pots for the most part because of the fact that I'm gonna be selling some seed starts. I got these from the Bootstrap Farmer. I'm also using uh, these little plastic six cell things from the Bootstrap Farmer. So this is what I'm using this year because I felt like these would be better for my plant cells. Now in years past, I've not gone and purchased that stuff. I've been doing my gardening on a really tight budget. And so I wanna take you guys to the store, uh, just like a box store where you know most people have access to, and I want to talk about some of the options for seed starting. I'm standing here in the seasonal gardening section that springs up in stores like this every spring, looking at the area of seeds and then uh, seed starting products. So here we've got, um, let's see, a big tray that has 72 little cells in it. They're pretty small. Um, these these Jiffy greenhouses that have the little things in them that expand whenever you water them and they've got all different sizes here there are 72 small ones um, 36 that are a little bit larger and then there's a smaller greenhouse and then peat pots um, here now let's just look at the prices of this stuff um, one of these things is 688 five dollars for that and of course you have to put some sort of growing medium in it this one is $12. And then the little pots, 
that's 250 for uh, 32 so I am not crazy about any of these products I'm not saying that they're bad and that you can't use them if it's what you have uh, by all means use what you have I have found with peat pots that they are a little bit difficult to keep the moisture right you can also reuse um, egg cartons toilet paper rolls those are obviously the more eco-friendly options and it's great to be able to reuse those things you're gonna have to be a little bit more vigilant in uh, watering and making sure that your soil is staying moist but those are okay and if you're not starting a lot of seeds that is a really good option to look into to um, deal with the watering issue and how quickly those dry out sometimes it's good to sit those in a tray that can hold a little bit of water so when you water them it's not just draining through and draining away um, as far as these little package <laughs> I thought you were somebody else. <laughs> Why are you watching me? Now let's talk about these little greenhouses with the expandable pellets. Um, I don't really like these to be entirely honest. I have used them before a handful of times. I've had people give them to me like they had grand ideas about starting seeds and they never did and they're like oh just gardens we'll give them to her i have a few issues with them one i've had a little bit of difficulty really handling the moisture i feel like a lot of times they would just be way too wet and therefore i would have poor germination in them I, you know, I've done control tests where I planted seeds out of the exact same package in a thing like this and then also in separate containers and pretty consistently for me, the separate containers on the same exact shelf of the greenhouse, so same conditions, have done better. The other thing is, is they're hard to mark. Um, you know you've got these there's no way to kind of stick a marker down in them easily so unless you're starting a whole lot of the same things it would be really easy to get your plants mixed up in one of these and the other issue that I've run into especially with these smaller ones you're gonna have to transfer those two larger containers anyway which might not be an issue for you but my take is if you're just looking for something to germinate your seeds in you would do a lot better with you know a simpler cheaper option now these are the options that are obviously Obviously marketed towards the gardener and here if this is what you thought you had to choose from you might come in and buy one of these trays and buy you know one of these five dollar bags of seed starting mix to get your garden off to the best start however I do want to implore you in regards to this just like anything else that you're going to be undertaking at your home and your garden or your homestead to think outside the box and think about what other products might work for what you're trying to do so let's head over to the other side of the store and and uh, look at some other options in the grocery area nothing to do with gardening I'm standing here in front of plastic party cup here you can get 50 containers for two dollars and 64 cents that work just fine for starting plants in you want to consider the size of the cup that you're buying um, I have used these for years now they are bigger these are 18 ounce cups typically so you're gonna have to put more soil in them you need to consider that however you can start seeds in these and they can grow all the way to the point of being transplanted into your garden and um, that is plenty of space root space for a good sized tomato plant for instance they won't get super leggy being next to each other it gives them ample space to get light so I really like them for that there are some other options. For instance, you can get 80 tiny little bath cups if you just wanna start some seeds, but you'll probably have to transplant out of these when they get a little larger. There are options for smaller cups that are clear, and I've had people ask me before if clear cups are okay, and they are. Um, I've, I've heard arguments before that there might be a downside to root systems being exposed to light, but I have grown in clear cups before without any adverse effect of course you've got options with uh, you know color coordination which could be a fun thing to use in the greenhouse and you could use paper cups and that would be also absolutely okay these are only nine ounces however these might start to break down after a couple of months of being watered I've not used those but it would be an idea if you wanted to experiment with it now I've had people ask me if foam cups are a good option and my personal opinion is that I don't, I won't buy foam cups to use. Now I know foam and uh, plastic as far as being ecologically minded, they're both, you know, you're just kind of choosing the lesser of two evils on here. However, for me in the past, 
I have been able to go into a party or a barbecue or a get together and mention to the host, hey, would you mind if I ask everybody to just stack their cups up here for me to take? Or if, you know, if we have a get together and someone brings a package of cups, I'll let everybody drink out of them for the night and then ask everyone to save them, run them through the dishwasher, and then I'll reuse those by starting plants in them. And I've had red plastic cups last for three seasons with plants being started in my greenhouse. Whenever I plant in them, I'll just save them, wash them out, and stack them up in a cool dark place until the next year so they don't break down. Uh, with foam cups, if you are going to buy those, they might be cheaper initially, but you're really only gonna get one use out of those because they're just not gonna hold up to being saved over the course of years. The only thing to keep in mind if you do decide to go the route of plastic party cups to start your seeds in, make sure you put drainage holes in the bottom of them. I'll actually put a clip in here of Sweet Maya's ingenuity and putting holes in cups. Um, I was doing them individually and then he came in and brought Rock, some innovation. Rocked, rocked my world. Brought some innovation to it. So now that you have a, an idea of your options as far as your planting medium and your planting containers, uh, what else do seeds need to start to germinate? Most things that you're going to grow in your vegetable garden do not need light to germinate. They need heat to germinate. You could put them in a warm place that is completely dark and they would come up. With the exception of some lettuces, um, a lot of perennial flowers do need light to germinate. And common things that grow in a vegetable garden will germinate uh, with just heat. Now, as soon as they're up and they've spent the energy that was contained in that seed, growing out of their seed and up above the ground, they need light to grow. But you need warmth to germinate. Um, basically, there's kind of like an optimal temperature that you want your seeds at for germination. And for most things, that's going to be in like the 70 to 80 degree range. That's optimal. That's not always feasible. Uh, for years, I have started seeds in an unheated greenhouse. This is my first year to heat my greenhouse. And it usually was in the maybe the 50 degree range. And a lot of those seeds did germinate. The peppers struggled because they need more heat. Now I did learn that that wasn't ideal because a lot of my plants were kind of wimpy at the beginning. So while you can germinate them in colder circumstances, it really is best to have warmth. If you can provide warmth for these seeds, especially when they're first getting started, uh, that is going to be really beneficial. And then once they're, they're started, they do still need warmth, but they really need a good amount of light. The more steady warmth in the 70 degree range that you can provide for them and the more steady light, as much light per day as you can provide for them, the better. I found that a really good way to go about that is starting things in the house if you don't have a space outside, uh, starting them on a windowsill. And then once they're up with their first real leaves in that sunny windowsill where they're, they're nice and warm and they're getting a good amount of light, once they're up with their first real light leaves, then you can start putting them out in the unhandy greenhouse or under a cold frame where they're getting more warmth during the day, but they're having a little more access to, to a nice full day of light. And it, basically you need to make sure that they're in a place that's not going to drop below like 45 or so degrees in the evening because you're really going to start having some issues with them if it does. If you are in a northern climate, and I, I always have people ask me about this stuff, I am a born and raised southerner, so I've never gardened in very cold places. However, I do have friends that garden in very cold places, and for your season extension in these places like you know Minnesota and the places where you're getting like negative 30 and in Canada, uh, that's mind-boggling cold to me. However, I know that the people that I have seen gardening in those places, a lot of times they're using grow lights and heat mats in their house to get their plants started and, estab and established. I know a lot of people who even do it here in the South because they don't have a steady temperature outside place, a greenhouse or something. And so that is a good option. The next thing that you need to know when it comes to seed starting is when your last frost date is. Um, this is based on your region and it's just an estimate. Don't 
treat it as a law. Now, uh, how you find out what your last frost date is, is you just Google it. Um, the uh, farmersalmanac.com is a website that'll have this, but there are multiple websites. And what I do is I just put in the search bar of Google, uh, last frost date for Conway, Arkansas, which is the closest city to me. And it pops up the first website. I click it and it says Conway, Arkansas, last frost date. April the 8th. Now what that will look like for me is that I will start my plants with that frost date in mind. However, I will not automatically plant my garden on April the 8th. Like, okay, the Farmer's Almanac said it, so it must be true. What it'll look like for me is when this greenhouse is completely bursting with plants that are big and ready to go in the garden and April the 8th is, you know, coming near, I'm going to be hooked to that 10 day forecast looking at it every single day and making sure that there are no lows within the next 10 days that are below freezing or anywhere dangerously close to it. Uh, last year, our last frost was forecasted as March 30th. And as it drew near, it became painfully obvious that we were not going to be planting the garden March 30th. I know several people in this area did. They lost all their tomatoes because it was still sleeting on April 16th last year. I didn't put my garden in until April 24th because that's how long it actually took for the frost to pass. Basically start your seeds according to that last frost date, but whenever that comes time, check the forecast, use common sense, and wait until you are sure that it's we're not gonna freeze anymore before you put your plants in your garden. Once you have that last frost date for whatever your region is, you get your seed packets out, and you figure out what needs to be started when. Like tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, you typically wanna start those things like six to eight weeks before your last frost date. Now you might think, well, what's the harm of starting them 12 weeks before? And the issue, like for instance with tomatoes, if you are so excited in January, even though your last frost isn't until April, and you want to start those tomatoes, if you were to start tomatoes in this little container, they're going to grow a certain size and this container is not going to be large enough. Each cell is not going to be large enough to really support that plant's root systems and nutritional needs. Not only that, you've got six plants that are so close together that they're going to start growing taller and taller, competing with one another for the light. And you end up with what's called leggy plants. So they would reach a point with this that you would need to upgrade them and say you put them in this. It's a little larger, gives them each more space. You can space them out a little bit. They can get more light, more nutrition. They can hold more water. But if they grow too big for this and you've still got a month or two months until you can actually plant them outside, you're gonna have to get a bigger container. You're gonna have to continue potting those up. If you start your plants way too early, you might end up having to get gallon planter containers to put each one in it and give them that much space. And so you really need to consider if you're going to be planting your plants that early and starting your seeds that early, do you have the space that that's going to require once those plants need larger and larger containers and more and more space to get adequate light and nutrition. So there's nothing wrong per se with starting your seeds that early, but if you're starting 50 tomato plants to put out in your garden, do you really have the space to do it that early? If not, just stick to six to eight weeks before. You, you do have a risk that your frost date may take longer than they anticipated, and you might end up with an extra few weeks. Last year when we had that extra uh, three weeks of freezing temperatures, my tomato plants started to get really leggy, and there was nothing I could do about it because my greenhouse was slam full. I couldn't, I couldn't repot them, and so I just had to deal with leggy plants. Now, it might get kind of tedious if I just sat here and read off a list of how many weeks before to start each variety. All of that that stuff is pretty simple um, to find out. However, I will link a chart below that tells you how long before the last frost you want to start things. Now, I don't know exactly how helpful it's going to be, but I figured I would just go ahead and show you guys how I start a, a seed. All right, I'm gonna set you up right here and just get a little container of soil. 
and just show, sow a seed where I can show you. I'm sure everybody has their own method of doing things. This is just mine. Um, this is not scientific. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a gardener and this is what's worked for me. What I typically do is I'll grab a container and I will fill it up heaping with soil and just press it down. Now I'm not looking to pack this massively. I don't want this to be super compacted. However, I don't want there to be so much air in this that when it settles, it dislodges my seed. So I just put it in there, pat it down and, and press it. So it's still nice, loose and fluffy soil. I'm not putting a ton of weight on it, but it's not so uh, full of pockets that the first time I water it, uh, my seed is going to get completely moved from where I had it. Now one thing I like to do before I sow my seed is water my soil. Your seeds can rot if they're too wet, but if they're not wet enough, they won't grow. So what I like to do is before I put my seed in, I go ahead and water my soil. It's nicely saturated. And that way when I put my seed in here, all I have to do is cover it up and I don't have to worry about it getting dislodged with that initial watering. After your seeds are started, you're going to want to keep that soil damp. A lot of people have a hard time with this, understanding how much to water. You don't want to water this every day. Uh, that would probably be too much moisture and it's really going to be dependent on the circumstances. For instance, in my greenhouse, I've got a heater running, but if we have multiple really sunny days in a row and it's really warm in here, the soil is going to dry out faster. However, if we have several overcast days, the soil is not going to dry out. You just have to watch it. A good rule to go by to see if your soil has enough moisture in it is think of a sponge. Uh, whenever it's sopping wet, okay? So you pick a sponge up out of a bucket of water and you touch it. And you know, like when you press on it, water just bubbles out. That's sopping wet, that's, that's too wet. You don't want your soil that wet. Now, if you squeeze that sponge and you touch it, you would still say, this sponge is wet, but it's not just dripping out tons of liquid. You want your soil to kind of be at the same level of a good wet, but not soaked sponge, like a sponge that's been squeezed out. Not wrong completely as dry as it could possibly be. That's too dry, but like a nicely wet sponge. I hope that helps you. I know that that probably uh, is still a little bit abstract, but this is one of the things that people really uh, stress out about. And honestly, I would say that gardeners tend to overwater rather than underwater. You can see when your soil is dry. It gets light colored, it's super loose. Uh, no seeds are going to grow in that. However, we tend to overcompensate that and try to water them every day because we're fussing over them and we're excited. So don't do that. Just touch your soil every day and, and, and see does it have the moisture and the consistency of a damp sponge. Now what I like to do at this point, because I am a very forgetful person, is I like to go ahead and mark what's in this. Now if I were using a red Solo cup or a plastic cup, I would just write directly on the side of that with a marker. Since I'm using one of these little black containers, I have these uh, garden markers that someone purchased for us off of our wish list. I will link these down below. There were 500 of them on Amazon and it was like 12 or $13. I've heard people suggest uh, using mini blinds. That's a really great way to reuse something. And someone told me that pencil does better on these and it doesn't fade. Um, I still just have this marker out here, so it's what I'm going to use today. So I'm going to go ahead and mark this. I've written on my marker. This is extra dwarf pock choy. And I like to go ahead and mark my container before I put a seed in, just so that I don't get mixed up and then forget what's growing where. And these are really tiny seeds, these pock choys. See, as you can see, these are really small. Good rule of thumb to get the depth right on sowing your seeds is that you want to sow seeds about two or three times as deep as the seed is wide. Um, that means things like carrot seeds and like teeny tiny little minuscule seeds, lettuce seeds, you surface sow, which you just sprinkle them and just kind of uh, 
mess the soil up on top of them you know I just I just sprinkle them on and then just kind of rub my hand across the top of that soil so they're not even really that covered up for things like tomatoes because you know the seed is is probably about this wide so I see so I'm about this deep that's where you're getting that eighth and inch measurement so how I do this instead of sticking my finger straight down you can kind of go a little too deep that way is I just press down like this and I create a dent in the soil that is just a little deep. I mean, you're hardly going to be able to see it on this because these are tiny seeds, so I'm not trying to go deep with them. And I usually will drop a few seeds in. I'm going to put four in this one. I'll get to thinning in just a moment. And then I'm just going to kind of tap a little soil over on top of this. I don't want to press that down. I don't want to compact it. Um, because this soil is, is wet, it's easy to accidentally like just dislodge a chunk so a lot of times what I'll do when I'm trying to cover it is rub the side I'll loosen up a little bit of the soil and just kind of brush it over on top of those seeds so that they are planted not too deep not compacted in a marked container with already moist soil now I'm done I don't have to do anything else to this except set it down in a place where it's going to be warm and then whenever it germinates make sure that it has enough light it'll be fine in my greenhouse thinning. I'm going to use this as an example. These are some kale seeds that I started the other day. I sat out here on the phone and ate a bunch of them. However, I left a couple in each one in order to be able to grow them. So I've got three sprouts here um, in this container. So I'm going to get two extra containers. So then I'm going to leave one in the original container and take them out. I don't have to pre-water this. Uh, these are not little seeds. These are little sprouts. They have a root. Once I put them in here, I can water them and they'll be fine. And you can do this with um, tomatoes, with peppers, with anything that you're starting and you have multiple sprouts. When I put them in here, I like to put my seeds far enough apart that when they do sprout, I can tease them apart and separate them. If you don't want to try to save every sprout and make it an individual plant, you just pinch them off. Like here, these are kind of close together. Um, and so I can just, what I do with my fingernail, pinch them off right at the soil line. With the remaining sprout, you can just toss it. Or if it's a delicious microgreen, eat it. But here, all I have to do is just reach down in here and grab enough of the soil that this is sitting in to pull it out. So I'm now holding this little plant's root system and I'm going to take one of the containers that I made, stick my finger down in it and make a hole and place that in it. You can usually kind of put that sprout down a little bit deeper so that you can press the soil around its little stem and give it a little extra strength. I'm gonna do the same thing here with this one. Now, if you accidentally don't go deep enough, like here you'll see, you see this little guy's root hanging out? It's okay, I've got for the most part its root system in my fingers and I'm gonna put it in this container. So now I had three sprouts in one container. Now I have three plants in individual containers. Now one thing I personally like to do when I start seeds um, is take a larger container, like I'll use something like this, or even a solo cup, something that's big enough, and I'll start like 10 of the same kind of tomato seeds in that one container. I'll mark the variety and just let that start. And once they've germinated and they have their first uh, set of leaves, that's when I go ahead and separate them up. To me, that's easier than labeling out uh, 10 different cups with 10 different labels and starting them all and having a few of those fail and then having to empty those cups back up. That's just how I like to do it, especially with things like tomatoes uh, and peppers and the things that I'm really wanting to just save every plant that germinates. All right, guys, I really hope that this information makes you feel encouraged and empowered to start plants from seed. It really does just open the door to a world of options in your garden. Um, you can fill your garden up with beautiful flowers and herbs and vegetables at a fraction of the cost that, would it, that it would take to buy all of those started plants at the store, as well as giving you so many options that you might not otherwise ever get to experience. Now it does have a little bit of a learning curve, but just 
try. If you feel like something's going wrong, if you feel like your plants aren't growing well, um, just troubleshoot it. If they're starting to get real leggy and long, separate them out. Make sure they're getting enough light. Just keep an eye on the heat, keep an eye on the moisture, but it really is totally doable and will give you such a wonderful sense of enjoyment to be growing something in these cold winter months while you're waiting for gardening season to come back, as well as all of the other benefits that I mentioned that you can experience in seed starting. If you have any questions or you would just like some more support through the process of seed starting, I want to invite you to join our Facebook group. It's called Friends of Roots and Refuge Farm. I will put a link down below. It's just a community we've created. It's a free group, but we've set that up in order to create a place where people can come and get support, get help, troubleshoot, and also just share the incredible joy of gardening. I really hope this helps you. I hope you feel empowered and encouraged. Thank you guys for watching. I bless you. Until next time.